two, one. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Monday, September 19th, 2023, regular schedule Board of, Ed Board of Education meeting. Uh, as always, before we begin, if you could please take a moment and check your cell phones, just make sure they're on silent or airplane mode, uh, just to not interfere with the, the video feed. Um, once we do that, if you could join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you, everybody. Okay, we'll start with roll call. Mr. Hatfield. Absolutely. Uh, President McFarland. Here. Vice President Rausch. Here. Secretary Hatfield is here. Treasurer Lauterbach. Here. Member Baker. Not here. Member Blazy. Here. And Member Frizzy is not here. There you go. Okay, we have a quorum. Very good. Uh, moving on to our consent agenda, we have item 2.1, approval of the minutes from August 15, 2022. Item 2.2 .2 is a list of staff being recommended for hire. Item 2.3 is a list of staff that have announced their resignation as well as the effective dates. Item 2.4 are the July financials, uh, but they are not available for approval until the October Board of Education meeting. Uh, item 2.5 is a request to authorize legal payments to the listed professional uh, firms, PDKST in the amount of $8,176.50 and Truen in the amount of $207.50. With that, I will accept the motion to adopt the consent agenda. Make a motion to approve the consent agenda items 2.1 through 2.5. I'll support. Motion by Mr. Rausch, support by Mr. Hatfield. Any additional discussion regarding the consent agenda? All in oh, favor? I'm sorry, Brad. For those that are listening, there was a, a bigger dollar amount for the PDKST, and that would be because that was the uh, sale and land division um, survey of the Swan property. So quite a bit there when you are um, excluding the the legal fees based on possession and merit. So there's quite a bit going on back and forth with the sale process. We're getting closer to closing on the sale. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? None. Okay. Motion carried. Thank you. Next up, we have presentations to the board. Item 3.1. These are the 2022-23 employee awards. Mr. Shero. I think they're going to run them across the screen for everybody. So a few weeks back, we um, well, it feels longer than that, probably a month or so back, uh, we had our opening day with our staff, which is a big event for us. And um, maybe for the last four or five years, we honored of our Gerstacker recipients and our Distinguished Service Award recipients. And <clears throat> the Distinguished Service is our is our support staff and the Gerstacker is our Teacher Proficiency Awards. And, you know, we have to mention the Gerstacker Foundation, the Gerstacker family. They've been supporting those for way beyond, I think, any of our memories on the teacher side and the DSA. I know, John, maybe you're on that one, 12, 15 years of the DSA or Phil's on that one, right? Yeah, I'm yeah. Sure. Yep. And so we are very pleased to give you a little bit of highlights on these wonderful employees that we have. First in the DSA was Amy Crowley. She's a para pro at Central Park Elementary. Amy Crowley joined the MPS team in 2013 as a paraprofessional at East Lawn Elementary. In 2006, she moved to Central Park to work with the Explorers in her role as a paraprofessional. Amy has earned her bachelor's degree from Hope College. We are excited to report that Amy was promoted to the position of lead administrative assistant at Central Park Elementary this summer. Second was Leslie Goddard, bus driver, uh, transportation paraprofessional. Leslie Goddard joined the MPS staff as a bus driver in the transportation department in 2003. We are excited to announce that beginning July 1st, Leslie was promoted to the position of manager of transportation. She got us off to a good start in her first year, so great job. Mary Hamilton, paraprofessional Chestnut Hill Elementary. Mary Hamilton joined the MPS team in 1992 as a para-pro at Chestnut Hill. Mary's entire 30-year MPS career has been set assisting students, staff, and families at Chestnut Elementary. And last up is Eric Smith, our IT computer technician in the technology department. Eric joined the MPS team in 2008 as a workstation technician. In 2008, he earned his bachelor's degree from Davenport University. 
This past summer, Erica was promoted to support specialist with oversight for the MPS Help Desk Team. Promotions must come with this award, so <laughs> we did a few of those. And on to our career stack of teacher proficiency awards. Uh, first was Mary Beth Curtis, teacher at Adams Elementary School. Beth Curtis joined the MPS team in 1990 as a fourth grade teacher at Chippewasi. In 2000, Beth began her tenure at Adams Elementary, where she continues today, 22 years later, as a third grade teacher. Beth earned her bachelor's degree from Indiana University with a major in elementary education and a master of arts degree in teaching elementary from Saginaw Valley State University. Next is Lori Hedrick teacher at our post-secondary program. Lori Hedrick joined the MPS staff in 2003 as a teacher at H.H. Dow High School in the post-secondary transition program. 19 years later, Lori continues teaching within the public school's TMI program. Lori earned her Bachelor's of Arts degree in Psychology from the University of Michigan Flint and a Master of Arts degree in Special Education, Mentally Impaired. <clears throat> Next up is T Tanya Lambert, teacher at Jefferson Middle School. Tanya Lambert joined the MPS staff in 1996 as an English teacher at Northeast Intermediate School. Tanya earned her Bachelor's of Science degree in English and French from Central Michigan University and her Master of Arts degree in Middle Level Education, also from CMU. In 1997, she was transferred to Jefferson Middle School, where she continues her MPS teaching career today. And last but not least is Jackie McGee, teacher at Woodcrest Elementary School. Jackie McGee joined the MPS team in 1997 as a special education teacher at Midland High School. In 2000, she moved to Woodcrest Elementary School as a K-5 special education teacher. Jackie continues her teaching career at Woodcrest today as a first grade teacher. She earned her Bachelor's of Science degree from the University of Minnesota in elementary education and her Master's of Education degree in special education from Bethel College. Congratulations to our recipients. I'm going to introduce Jen, and then we'll let her introduce the whole team uh, that worked on our summer school programming. Yes, so. sure. Thank you. All right. Good evening, and thank you for having us. My name is Jen Service. I'm the elementary curriculum specialist for MPS. I have the pleasure to introduce my new colleague to you this evening, Joe Amabili. Uh, one of our new secondary curriculum specialists is here to help present. Joe joined our team in July and hit the ground running with all things MPS, one being our summer school program. Welcome, Joe. Also joining us this evening is Andy Filipek. Andy led the summer school programming as our programmatic functional support specialist at the middle schools and is here this evening to share highlights from that program. We are excited to be here this evening to share the comprehensive summer learning program we created for our MPS students. I would like to begin by giving a huge shout out to our teachers and paraprofessional staff. We had 92 teachers and 29 paraprofessionals participate in summer school this year, and we served over 600 students. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for having me here. I'm honored to share in the, uh, the accomplishments of summer school. Uh, my name is Joe Mobley. I'm the Senior Curriculum Specialist. It's nice to finally see you guys face to face, and so it's, I'm glad to be here. Uh, can you go back to that slide? Sure. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, yeah, the predominant focus for summer school was ELA and mathematics. Um, we were focused on remediating some areas of growth for individual students, and then also strengthening the skills that would lead into the, this school year. And again, you can see the slide, the, the math and language arts was the focus there, okay? Um, there were multiple learning modes, which was basically a kind of aligned to our, our district vision of providing experiences that were equitable, inclusive, and a collaborative environment for students. This meant like individual instruction, group work. There was a lot of different modes through which students were learning. And you can see also that we were trying to approach the whole, the whole student by providing um, you know, transportation and lunch and breakfast and removing barriers for families that couldn't get their students there on time. And uh, we are going to move to Jen. All right, so we'll start with funding. Um, as you can see from this slide, the first two bullet points, section 23B and ESSER 2, are newer to us and available specifically in response to COVID. 31A funds are not new to MPS, and we have been strategically using those over the past several years for various summer learning programs. Title 1A is available only to Central Park and Plymouth, 
based on the parameters of that specific federal grant. So we'll start with elementary summer learning. Elementary summer school programming was offered between June 6th and August 4th, both virtually and in person. Evidence-based practices suggest that one-on-one -on -one tutoring and or small group sessions have the most impact on student learning. So this year, all six elementary buildings ran both one-on-one -on -one and small group sessions with students. NWEA scores and individualized reading improvement plans were used to select students for this summer learning opportunity. The focus, as Joe mentioned, was math and literacy. I am pleased to report that we had 356 elementary students participate this summer, along with 56 elementary teachers and 20 elementary paraprofessionals. This year, Plymouth, Chestnut Hill, and Central Park all hosted their, se their sessions at Central Park Elementary, while Adams, Siebert, and Woodcrest hosted their own in-house programs. Our elementary program had a 92.6% attendance rate. Next slide. In addition this year uh, to the elementary tutoring and small group summer learning, Central Park in Plymouth hosted a one week kindergarten readiness program. At Plymouth, the staff invited students that had either not participated in a preschool experience or only had a half day preschool experience. At Central Park, the staff connected with Longview and chose students that received preschool services through Longview. In addition, CPE worked with local preschools and identified students in need of additional supports in regard to transitioning to kindergarten. Occupational therapists, family intervention specialists, and other members of Central Park support staff were on hand to offer assistance and ideas for successful transition of kindergarten to Central Park students. On the last day of the program, there was a parent informational meeting and parents learned ways to support their child with transition to kindergarten and learn ways to support their child at home. Staff in both buildings loved this opportunity and feel that it really helped students become familiar with the building and the school staff. It gave teachers the opportunity to talk with parents and students before the start of the school year and it gave students the opportunity to meet potential classmates. And finally, some feedback from elementary. Teachers shared that they loved the flexibility and ability to create their own schedule. Teachers enjoyed the quality time with their students individually and in small groups, and most felt that it was very meaningful and rewarding. Families shared that they loved being able to create a schedule with the teacher to work around things such as sports schedules and vacations. Families noted the growth that they saw in their children and they were grateful for the extra support and help over the summer. And finally, our students enjoyed the small setting and noted that they loved the extra attention and support. In many instances, students had summer school with their former classroom teacher. They loved that they already had a trusting relationship and connections with that teacher. Next up, middle school. Hello, uh, I'm Andy Filipek. If you don't know me, I uh, teach over at Northeast Middle School. I teach mainly mathematics and special education. This past year, I got the opportunity to organize and run the behind the scenes for both middle school programs at Northeast and Jefferson. Uh, at Northeast, which was held at Northeast, um, uh, we had 81 students, 11 teachers, uh, and four paraprofessionals. Um, I was split between Northeast and Jefferson, so I spent half the time at Northeast, half the time at Jefferson. Our students uh, had 94% positive attendance. Uh, we, For Northeast, our theme was uh, community superheroes, so they did spend some time uh, with some Mid Midland City police officers uh, they visited the Midland Humane Society um, and also donated items to uh, some uh, those in need. And they uh, actually, with with supplies, they made quilts um, that they, that were donated to um, some different uh, organizations in the community. Uh, go ahead for Jefferson. At Jefferson, Ted Davis hosted us over at Dow High School, so that was a bit. A big thanks to Ted. Uh, he, he 
was housed, uh, I think, three programs there. So um, we had 52 students that uh, were going into Jefferson. Uh, there were seven teachers, three paras, 91% um, positive attendance. And their theme was a little bit different. Um, their theme was nailed it. Like, you know, they nailed the problem. They nailed summer school. Um, they got, they, their guests, uh, they had the rock, uh, came and for the discover you program and spent time with the kids, helping them figure out what were some, uh, characteristics that they had and strengths that they could use towards their futures. Um, and then also Chris Welch from aviator cookie came and spoke with the, the group and, then they took a trip to the Midland Farmers Market where they got to interview the different uh, businesses that were set up there. So that was uh, Jefferson Middle Schools. And then the last slide is just feedback um, from students and staff. I, I highlighted a couple things there was um, that one student said that he definitely caught up. The teachers were great. Uh, the teachers made their life easier by um, letting them get to know the building and catch up on English and math, um, and that the teachers did not give up on them. Some of the staff gave feedback that uh, they felt the kids were really making a connection and that the administration uh, did a good job supporting them over the summer. All right, Zoe, back up. Andy is a tough act to follow. I think if you, if there's anything you heard from him, how unique the summer school program is and the opportunities that we have, the themes, the visits, police getting involved, you know, the, the superhero theme. It's very unique. Um, the high school, I'm going to speak a little bit to the high school. The high school's focus was on credit recovery. Um, and again, they were supported by uh, teachers. The, most of the coursework was focused on first semester coursework. And there was a certified subject area teacher present every day for students to either get that individualized instruction, work in small groups. So like, again, it was very focused on individual student needs. And you can see there that it ran from June 8th to June 30th. Um, again, uh, the attendance rates have been high. The course success rate is high. That's, that's incredible, 97% course success rate. Uh, at high school level, there was 132 students, 18 teachers, one program, functional support specialist, and two paraprofessionals. That's roughly one adult to every six or seven students. So again, the support that these students had um, and the teachers that were involved really made this successful. So. Um, again, I reiterate the appreciation that we have for teachers and, and, and the work that they did this summer. Um, there was an emphasis, as we've said a few times already, on math and ELA. Uh, in terms of credit recovery, that was the focus of high school. There were 44 students who were in math credit, 61 students. These are 61 students, 61 families that don't ever have the pressure now of regaining credit for ELA. You know, re they regain that credit. Uh, and, you know, we mentioned math and ELA, but there were some students that went further and got social studies credit. There were 10 of them, six science credits, and then six or eight more credits in health. Um, so, and then you can see there too that in math and ELA, there were some students that earned uh, credit in both semesters for that year. So a lot of gains, a lot, it was an advantage. It was, is a very robust program that I think impacted a lot of students over the summer in a very short period of time. So. With that said, what questions might you have for us? Sorry. At what point, uh, with respect to the high school program, because I didn't have my microphone on, uh, do students apply for the credit recovery, or who, who tells them about it that it's that it's even available? I'm going to guess that it's the teachers and the administration in the buildings, but. Uh, since I arrived in July, I would like to. I can take that. Sure, yeah, all right. Uh, yeah, so both of the high schools collaborated on what we call an entrance criteria, so determining which students would qualify for credit recovery, which is pretty easy when you pull a report of students who didn't get a passing mark. And then they zoned in a little more on the students who we knew would actually take advantage of that, uh, finding other strategies for students who might not have been able to access uh, summer school. But as you can see by our attendance and completion rates, we really picked the group that we knew would maximize this opportunity. Okay. Um, I mean, the attendance rates are incredible. Um, almost 93% at the elementary level, 94%, 91%, 97%. Is it, is the, before I get to the attendance rates, 
the 97% success rate, is that an indicator of credit recovery efforts or is that an atten attendance? Marker? I believe that's credit recovery efforts. Okay. okay. Wow, that's fantastic. Yeah, it is fantastic. Um, in the crit feedback, were there any criticisms or suggestions on what we may do better to, to attract more or to retain that extra 6% outlier? We gathered feedback from middle school uh, families in preparation for this, but I think that's a great point to get rather more feedback in terms of what we could do better. I think um, in regards to how much we differentiated and, and to the point of you know creating different themes for students coming in and making it not just you know a summer school that we all might have went to when we were little. It was very different. It was very focused. It was very. Um, it wasn't just a sit and get. You know, so we're open to feedback. Yeah, absolutely. To how to make it better. Fantastic. Some of the some of the themes that I'd heard and just want to rehighlight because I think they're the best practices. Right. Was one. I really appreciate the fact that you work with parents to schedule around their kids' schedule. So we, you know, part of summer is also growing up on the playground and in the sports field. So it's it's awesome that these students still have those same opportunities. So really appreciate that. I also wanted to highlight, you know, you spoke to the use of data, data-driven practices, one-on-one -on -one settings, small groups, NWEA scores to track success. Um, and it just further highlights that we're not just doing what we think is good for our students, but we've proven it as well. Um, and it's all driven through the success numbers that Scott just highlighted around attendance, credit recovery, and test scores. Jen or, or any other, or Joe, do you have, are you starting to get longitudinal data for long, you know, so, if I remember correctly, last year, I think we averaged right about 10% of our students mm -hmm. attended some form of summer school. This year, maybe 8 9%. So we're still getting great uptake. but Right. And so, yes, and our NWEA window um, will be closing this week. We had a few outliers with, you know, some illnesses and, and such. Um, but working with Mary Chilton, our testing coordinator, to really kind of cohort these groups of students and then be able to track them with NWEA scores and at elementary um, uh, individual reading plans with students, you know, to just continue to track that progress and really use that information as part of our data meetings at the school level uh, to determine next needs. Um, a lot of these students have started the school year already, uh, you know, with, with intervention plans and supports around them to continue that work. So yes, we are beginning to collect that data and we'll carry that through with these groups of students. Wonderful, thank you. Have we ever done the kindergarten read readiness program before? No, this was the first year um, actually uh, that Plymouth and Central Park were working um, with Penny and just really talking about how we can um, transition those students. And so this was the first year and it, it was very, very successful. Did you envision doing it at all buildings? I, I could potentially see that happening, right, Penny? Yeah. Although the funding will be I'll the say piece, right? Title one A funding is specific to those two schools, okay. and there is a supplement supplant rule. So if we might choose that as an effective practice that we want to leverage across the district, we won't be able to access Title one funds for that. Okay. Uh, that's not to say that we couldn't consider thirty one A funds or some other pot of money. This was. This was our proving ground um, yeah. to just dig in and, you know, all the credit to Kara Stark. I think this was actually her idea initially, and, and Margaret joined on over at Plymouth, and we're really excited about where it could go. Yeah. So, John, summer school one time at MPS was, well, um, to say it nicely, very little at all. And so I've had great success throughout my career with Iris students. And summer school is a big component. And so you've seen it grow and grow and grow. And it's changing the mindset of teachers, staff, community members. And so, you know, your question about expansion, I think we should continue to expand as an intervention strategy. Yeah, I'll just pair on to that to say, you know, serving 600 plus kids, it's a lot of work. So a big thanks to the curriculum team who was part of that. Our principals as well stepped up to help do this. And of course, teachers, we couldn't do it without teachers. I want to draw your attention to the fact that this summer we had more teachers um, providing direct live instruction with students. The previous summer we tried to leverage ingenuity a little bit more in the middle schools and high schools. And I think you can see by the feedback, um, 
that that connection with the teacher matters is what kept them coming day after day and I think led to the success. So we hope next year we can get just as many teachers, if not more, willing to step into this. Penny, that goes along with my question. Um, with this model, run them through the numbers really quick, the 356, 56, 20, and then the 81, 11, 4, 52, 7, and 3, 5 to 1, 5 to 1, 5 to 1, 5. So that's uh, pretty amazing that we have five children to every adult that's there to provide services. And obviously, these kids excelled with the one-on-one, -on -one and having those kinds of numbers, I guess that's a recipe for success. Right? Right. Can't go backwards, no. Nope. Right. <laughs> well, and keeping that in mind, just sustain that, that's one of the reasons I will continue to talk about finances and the even more in a strong position. You're, you're able to offer more programming, more interventions when you stay in a strong financial position. So, any other questions, comments? Thank you so much. Thanks for having Thank us. Thank you very much. Scott, speaking of strong financial positions, it's time to hear from the auditors. And how, how's, how's that teaming up? That was a nice segue. I was going to mention <laughs> that, actually. So good evening. My name is Jessica Rolf. I'm a principal with Yo and Yo. Um, tonight, I'm here to go through the results of your financial statement audit for the year ended June 30th, 2022. Um, we met with the Finance Committee a week or two ago, went through this in a little more detail. So I'm just going to summarize um, the main points, you have a lot of stuff in front of you, but the one you want to look at is the PowerPoint presentation that's bound. It's got that clear copy on the front. So the first slide here is our opinion. So this is what we're hired to do, is to give an opinion on your financial statements. We had an unmodified opinion again this year. That means it's a clean audit. Um, it means that these financials are appropriately presented. They're in accordance with the accounting principles that they should be, and that we feel that they're free from any material errors. The other thing that's in the opinion this year, which is new, is we adopted a new standard. We've been talking about it for years and years, and it kept getting delayed, and we finally had to do it, and it was for leases. Um, it made us record all leases on our books as some sort of asset or liability, and that's whether we're a lessee or a lessor. So we'll see that as I go through the presentation that there are some new lines in the financial statements related to that. Next up here, I have the balance sheet of your general fund, so your main operational fund. You'll see total assets were about 42.4 million this year. That's up about 3.7 million from the prior year. Big changes, lease receivable. So you're gonna see that new line that has to do with the new standard. It's a $1.8 million lease receivable, which really stands out. That is cell phone tower leases. You guys have some very lengthy cell phone tower contracts, which is normal, a lot of my districts do. And we have to record those leases for the length of that contract. And I believe a lot of yours were 60 years. Um, so that's why the number's so large. However, if you look down further under the liability section, that same number shows up. So the net effect to this is really zero, but it's something that we now have to put on the books and report. Other bigger changes in your assets, um, your due from other governments was up, more state aid this year. We'll talk about that when we get to the revenue as well, but the receivable was up as well for that. Other items that stand out, you'll see cash was down, but investments were up. So some of that money got moved into investments this year. Liabilities, those were pretty consistent with last year as we would expect, nothing big there. That lease number, which I mentioned, so that asset and liability. And then we get down to our fund balance, which was an increase of about 1.4 million from last year. Next up, we have the statement of revenues, expenditures, and changes in fund balance. So these are all the revenues and expenses for the fiscal year. Revenues were about $91.9 million. Those were down about 800,000 from last year. A um, Couple things went into that. Your state aid was up about 2.7 million. Federal revenue was down. Um, we did have a little more ESSER funding this year, but there were some CRF funds last year, about 2.8 million that we didn't get this year. So that was kind of the decrease in the federal line. And then local property taxes were down a little bit from last year as well. Expenditures, those were up about 2 million. Lots of things go into those. So the kind of bigger ones that stood out were your normal step increases, 
um, the return from virtual school, so a lot more in-person um, schooling, which means more costs there for teachers, paras, things like that. Um, and then summer school resuming to normal operations was another larger cost. So the number to pay attention to on this slide is that change in fund balance. So that's your net income or your net loss for the year. We had a net income for general fund of $1.4 million this year that we added to our fund balance. Here we look at your comparison to budget. So you'll see where your final budget was compared to where your actual was. Um, you budgeted for a loss of around $3 million. Um, as I mentioned before, we came in uh, to the good about 1.4 million. Um, I don't want this to alarm anybody. Every district I've talked to this year has had the same situation. Everybody's been conservative. These ESSER funds are very up and down, lots of money coming in, lots of strategies changing. You know, you think you know what you're gonna spend it on and then another pot of money comes in and things get shuffled around again. So everybody's been pretty conservative with some of that stuff. Um, also, I know your employer costs came in a little lower than expected. Um, and just monitoring expenses better and some of the supply costs came down as well than what you originally budgeted. Again, just the actual comparison, a little more summarized than the slide I had before, but we already kind of talked about those revenues and the little bit of changes in the state aid going up, the federal and the local going down a little bit, and then those expenditures going up around 2 million. This slide just shows your revenue kind of by bucket. I know I talked a lot about how the federal went one way, the local went one way. So this is the percentages of the money coming in. Um, obviously the largest chunk of it is state. 67% uh, of your funds are coming from state aid. Last year that was about 63%. So that relates to the increase I mentioned. Um, federal was down a teeny bit to those coronavirus relief funds. Everything else fairly consistent as you would expect it to be. Just a comparison throughout the years as well, so you can see how the federal, state, and local money has moved over time. Um, again, you can see the comparisons to last year and just how over the last five years, um, pretty consistent overall. Obviously, that state aid really standing out more this year than it has in the past. Another slide here showing the general fund expenditures by object. Uh, obviously, the biggest cost in any district is those salaries and benefits. Um, last year that was 84%, so that has increased to 86% with some of the things the district has done to implement step increases, stipends, all those things that have come. Again, just a comparison by year, so you can see how that's trended over the year by function. Um, you can compare this instruction and support and see how that's increased over the years, pretty much the same. Um, so we're not, you know, putting more money into support and not instruction. That's kind of trended up the same throughout the years. This slide here shows your general fund revenue and expenditures by pupil. Um, you can see while there's a lot of this one-time funding coming in for ESSER, we're spending it. You can see that gap has closed again this year. So a lot of the money coming in is not being used to build fund balance. It's being used for the purposes it was intended and being put back into the district. Um, general fund fund balance. So this is always a slide people like to see. Um, it's your fund balance as a percentage of expenditures. You can see that was about 33%. Um, unassigned spendable fund balance of expenditures is about 27%. I know Midland Public Schools goal has usually been around 20%. Um, MDE recommends around 15 to 20%. But also keep in mind, well, yes, that's a good number and a healthy number, that makes sense. We're in a very healthy time for education right now. Like we're getting more funding than we ever had. So it makes sense that that number is a little higher so that when those bad times come or something like COVID hits, your fund balance and you can handle those kind of unexpected changes. Uh, the bottom part of this slide shows how much your fund balance could support your district if all other revenue went away. So today, we lost all revenue sources, how long would we survive? And you can see we did it based on a 365 day year and a school year, and really that comes to about a third of a year, right? So kind of puts that into perspective a little more. The other number on here is the assigned fund balance. So that's money that's been set aside um, for future things that we know are coming, right? The tech bond replace, or tech replacement, bus replacement, copy replacement, planning for those things in the future and having those funds set aside already because we know they're coming and things will have to be updated down the road. 
Next up, I know we've been talking about bonds a lot throughout the years. So this is just the progress of where you're at with series two. You can see this one's getting pretty close to done. Um, should be wrapping up the majority of that in the coming years. Next up, same thing for the energy conservation bond, also close to being done. So you can see how that's trended over the last two years. So now we get to the little more exciting part, and this is where our results are. So did we have any findings? Did we have any issues? Did we have any big journal entries? And you'll see as you run down there, it was a lot of no, no, no. So we didn't have any findings this year or concerns in regards to the financial statements. We did have two recommendations. The first one is one, well, I guess the second one is one we had last year about the food service fund balance. So you're required to have three months of expenditures in your food service fund balance or less. Right now, the fund balance is higher than that, which every district I've presented at has the same problem. A whole other year of free lunch has really inflated that fund balance number in the food service fund. And a lot of the supply chain issues have caused issues too, trying to spend that money down, get things in that aren't coming in. Um, so that was another comment this year. The reason it's a comment is MDE automatically calculates that when we submit the audit, and they look for it to be a finding if you're over. So this is our explanation of we recognize it's an issue, but we don't feel it's a finding because it's kind of out of your control. So that's why the comments there again this year. I know there's a spend down plan in place, so hopefully that'll be gone next year as we spend down some of that fund balance and it won't be a whole year of free lunches either. The other comment we had this year related to construction in progress. Um, when management was doing the reconciliation this year, we noted that there was an error in the report we received from the management company last year. Um, so we just wanted to make sure that there were some controls and put in place to check that next time. So to make sure it doesn't happen again. And I know management's already implemented some things to do that. Last up here is our, if we were to have any findings related to your federal dollars. Um, each year we pick programs to test based on a calculation. The program we tested this year was the Education Stabilization Fund, which is also known as ESSER, which makes sense. It's a big dollar coming through. Um, we had an unmodified opinion on that as well. We had no findings, no issues, no concerns with that. Um, there's a lot of money flowing through the district and everything looked to be in compliance with the requirements. My last slide here is just about future challenges. I know these are all things you guys already are well aware of, um, but just to keep in the front of your mind when you're talking about finances and your decisions in the upcoming year, spending and compliance related to state and federal funding, there is a lot of money coming through with ESSER and just making sure that you're in compliance with all the requirements you're supposed to be in watching that. Inflation and supply chain issues, I mentioned before, you know, trying to spend on fund balance and do those things. Sometimes that's been difficult or trying to spend money with the bond because of those issues. Long-term budgeting, so these ESSER funds are coming for years. Um, for It's not just an easy one-year thing that we're gonna plan for. So deciding how to use those funds, making changes as you need to, amending those budgets if need be. Um, the last one on here, so I mentioned the lease implementation. Um, that was a big standard this year. Obviously, it added a $1.8 million receivable to your books and a liability. So next up is GASB 96, which is very similar. It has to do with software agreements. So those are going to be recorded on your books very similar to leases, where we'll have an asset or a liability for software-related arrangements. Um, so that'll be a bigger one next year, trying to track all those, get them ready to go, to put them on the books for the audit next year. The last two things on here we've mentioned every year, just those pension obligation and net um, and OPEB obligations. You know, those are big numbers on your books. They fluctuate year to year based on assumptions and stock markets and all those things. But keep in mind, you know, those are kind of the state's obligations that are on your books. Um, so while it is a big number, it's something you don't have a whole lot of control over. And I think that's all I had. So I'll take any questions. <laughs> Would you mind just for a moment, um, for those of us in the audience uh, who may not understand what's involved in the audit process, could you give a highlight reel? Well, it's a very long process. Okay. Um, each just audit. Version might be different than Laurie's. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to put it in words that everybody explains because even my husband's like, what do you do? I don't know. <laughs> but it takes about 200 hours to do an audit. Um, we really get a trial balance of where all your accounts are 
and we verify that those balances are accurate with some sort of supporting documentation. And obviously we don't verify every single balance and every single transaction. We do sampling, we look at risk, we look at dollar thresholds, and we verify that those numbers are right and accurately represented. The other piece of an audit we do is we look at internal controls. So we make sure that the controls you have in place for your processes help prevent fraud, error, and um, result in accurate financial information. So we walk through those processes as well. Okay, um, so you didn't find any fraud? No. I will say we are not obligated to look for fraud if it's not material. <laughs> Can you give us, you say there's no material weakness. What is a material weakness? So there's two levels of findings. There's a material weakness or a significant deficiency. A material weakness would mean that we think whatever the finding would be would mislead the user if it hadn't been fixed. A significant deficiency is kind of more auditor judgment. We don't think it's big enough to be a material weakness where it would mislead someone in the financial statements, but it's big enough where we don't think it's just something to make a comment about. So there's some judgment there with those. Okay. Um, how about material non-compliance? What does that mean? So non-compliance has to do with requirements such as with the single audit report. So with ESSER, for example, the feds issue a compliance supplement and it has a list of things you have to do to be compliant with your ESSER grant. So if we were to have a finding related to just compliance, so maybe your numbers are right, but you didn't do something with the grant that you were supposed to do. Like maybe you didn't send letters to the private schools or some of those other pieces that are required for compliance. If we thought it could have a material impact on the grant or have to return funds, then it would be a material non-compliance. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, one thing I want to highlight, Lori, appreciate you and your team and your work. How many unmodified opinions in a row is this for you now? And I, I want to highlight how good of a, of a team we have because it's, it's the taxpayer's money. We are fiduciaries of the taxpayer and it's imperative that we spend the money in the right way in which the community wants it spent. And it, I want to highlight Lori and her team and congratulate them. Good point. Thank you. And one other thing to that, too, I will say, you're my first audit of the year every year, and you're not a small district. So that says a lot to your management team as well, to be able to turn that around that quickly. I'm still just starting districts that are smaller than yours. Um, so to not have findings, not have adjustments, to turn things around that quickly says a lot to your team as well. And I really felt this was the best audit we've had in years. It really went well. We were pretty much done by the end of the week. So definitely kudos to your team. So the construction in progress reconciliation was simply a WIP report that an ending balance didn't match a beginning balance. Yeah, so they're, they give you a balance to contracts <laughs> report of where everything's at. Um, they had put some wrong amounts in there that didn't belong in last fiscal year. Okay. Um, so we caught it when we were reconciling this year's construction in progress. And because it wasn't a huge number, you know, it didn't stand out last year. But I know they've put some processes in place to reconcile that more closely to their capital outlay accounts throughout the bond instead of just when the bond's complete. Okay. And for those of you out there, it's extremely difficult in construction work to draw a line in the sand to make that the dollars work exactly where you're going to draw the line in the sand. So WIP reports are uh, extremely difficult. Now you know. <laughs> okay. Point. Any other questions? Comments? Thank you so much. We appreciate all your hard work. And Thank you, guys. Wonderful night. Thanks. <laughs> uh, yes, we okay, this is an action item, and I will... Uh, accept the motion at this point to adopt the audit report. I move that we adopt the uh, audit report from uh, item 3.3. So, okay, motion by Mr. Hatfield, support by Mr. Lauterbach. Any additional discussion regarding item 3.3? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion carries. Thank you very much. All right, that brings us to item number four request to address the board. And first up this evening, we have Mr. Larry Levy, please. Good evening, sir. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, 
complaining a little cold. I have a few remarks for the board that grew out of my attending the VFW meeting of the Moms for Liberty the other night. Some thoughts on that. <clears throat> my name is Larry Levy. My family and I moved to Midland 45 years ago when I was hired to teach English and literature at Delta College. In my years of full-time teaching, I taught at every level from preschool through graduate school and in diverse settings. For years, I taught exploratory teaching, a course for college sophomores interested in K through 12 teaching careers. The course took me into public and private school classrooms all over the Tri-Counties and beyond. Some of those former students are teaching in Midland now. For seven years, I chaired the English division at Delta. I've also volunteered in many classrooms and have co-directed with my wife about 20 Midland Youth Theater productions. I've coached many youth sports for boys and girls and older kids as well, including college. In other words, I have paid some dues in real classrooms. I have some idea what teachers do all day, the challenges they face. I have certainly learned how humbling teaching can be, as well as how rewarding. And having been also twice elected to the MPS board, I have some idea what it takes, the time and patience it requires to be a decent member of a board of education. Among other qualities, it helps to have some humility. If elected, you get one seat and one vote. If you wanna be taken seriously, you learn quickly or eventually to respect those you work with your board colleagues, your superintendent, and all district administrators, all the district's teachers and employees, all the students with their diverse interests and needs, and all your constituents. Back in the day, I had a board colleague who often used the phrase, our constituents, as in our constituents want us to do this, or our constituents require that. Typically, he would say that in defense of a vote we were about to take, implying that his vote was the right one. Many times I voted with this man. On a few occasions, I did not. And on one occasion, when he reminded me what our constituents wanted, I stopped him. You keep using those words, I said. Have you taken some poll of our community with which I am unfamiliar? Do you have your finger on the pulse of our community in a way I do not? My hunch, as I told him, was that when he said our constituents, he was probably referring not to the whole of the community, but to a slice, his coworkers, people in his neighborhood, members of his church or social club, people who voted like him. I have a similar hunch about the Moms for Liberty and their year of the parent, that they are parents, sure, but do they speak for all parents? I am certain they do not. Mr. Levy, I've got it. I've got it. Cut you off, sir. I'm sorry. Three minutes. Am I am I excused? You're gonna let me finish? No, we, we, we have a three minute rule. Uh you've gone over thirty seconds or so. Um, and that's how we do it. I'm sorry. Everybody is the same. I apologize, sir. I I, I treat everybody the same way. They can run over a little bit, but we don't let it stray much beyond that. I'm sorry. Next, we have Wendy Brand. Good evening, ma'am. Thank you for joining us. Good evening. Thank you. There are three sides here, all thinking that we're fighting each other for the good of the children. What the children really need is to see what adults should be doing by uniting, conversing, perhaps even breaking bread together, and civilly discussing how to best serve the children. With open discussions outside of here and the school board members actively discussing and participating, this isn't a battle between three sides. It's a battle between two, good and evil. 
If the board acts with the liberal side alone, we could all lose. If the board stands with the conservative side alone, we could all lose. A two-legged stool can't stand on its own. The board should be standing with both sides and leaving politics and the one-sided, agenda-driven funding out of this. They don't belong in a local school. That appears to leave all of you, the board, whose intentions may be good, against those you were elected to represent, leaving your hands tied. Whether you know it or not, a person bound is a prisoner, even if they are able to roam free. Our struggles here are not against one another. However, we do have a con common enemy and he is hard at work. The only solution to these current dilemmas is to all sit down together as responsible and wise adults and have an actual focused discussion on the children, readdressing questions such as what is the role of the parents, what are the, of the school and the, the board in children's public education, not what does the government want to teach our children and that's all that matters. This is a local school with plenty of what it needs to run a great school system meant to bring up responsible adults who can be productive members of a healthy community. Liberals might feel though that conservatives are the enemy and conservatives might feel as though liberals are the enemy. The board might feel as though they have three opponents, liberals, conservatives, and the government who appear not to care about uh, any side but their own. That's the government. Um, we're doing things from a divided place, a judgmental place, a blind place, a broken place. And this kind of place will not prevail and will ultimately be in rubble, leaving the children with nothing. Either way, it takes us back to square one. Perhaps that's where we should go. Let's go back to the board, the drawing board. Let's be kind, caring, and responsible adults for the children. In order for the stool to stand with strength, we need all three legs to be strong. It's not a you, us, or them. We all want what's best for the children, and we all think we know what's best for them. And somewhere in the middle lies the truth, which we need to come together and find for the children. If we desire to be good role models for them, then we are supposed to avoid strife. Ancient scripture says, where there is strife, there is pride, but wisdom is found in those who take advice. Will all of you, will all of us, be better role models? I invite you all to sit down to a meal together. Let's pick a time, a location. We can do potluck style, get a neutral mediator, and have a real discussion. Who will join me? Thank you. OK, I don't have anybody else listed after Ms. Brand, but I know several of you came in after the list was given to me. Uh, so before we move on in the agenda, is there anybody else who would like to address the board in the audience tonight? Yes, ma'am. Please. Just like first meeting here, so. Please Welcome. What, what's your name? Oh, my name is Suma Charakuri. I'm a mother of a second grader at Mifflin um, Woodcrest Elementary. Um, my concern here today is I'm actually an adult psychiatrist by profession. So mental health is a big concern for me. And one of the concerns also is how mental health interacts with school safety. And which comes to my next statement is, um, I did talk to a parent of a child from whose children were in the Auburn school system. And I found out that their level of security at their front doors was very different from ours. And this, made me quite upset because I had this assumption and I'm going to talk about things that probably upset people but you know we talk about Parkland and Uvalde and Sandy Hook and in each of these cases things were done within four to ten minutes okay and and I know every parent here cares about their child from whatever background you're coming from so my concern would be are we doing everything we can and I'm I'm naive and, and open to learn for our school system and our children and our staff because I really do believe education is an amazing place. And I think that we have so much to offer for a big nerd in the school system. I mean, this is an amazing school system, I have to say that. And the biggest question I have was, I did reach out to Mr. Shera's office and Mr. Shera was kind enough to communicate with me about how the recommendations for the front door systems are based off of safety experts and their best practices. But my concern would be, um, are these back to practices when I, I did, I called the elementary, middle school, and high school of all the Bullock schools, Bullock Creek schools, all the schools in Auburn, and I found out different practices. There's practices that are actually stricter than ours. 
which actually kind of got me worried because I thought we were all in the same boat. I understand there's going to be a vote soon about maybe some type of weapon detection, metal detection that's coming up. That's what I read in the newspaper. But my concern would be, um, I know that school violence and shootings and things like that are low risk, but after they happen, everybody feels and questions and looks back. So the biggest things I've seen is, are we completely communicating with law enforcement regarding any miscommunication that could occur? Are we looking at predictable warning signs of violence that is often committed by students? And we have a great platform, kindness, correct, is the main theme of Midland Public Schools, which I think is awesome, okay? That's, that's really impressive for someone who's in psychiatry and looking at mindfulness concepts. But the thing I wanna understand is, are we looking at everything? Are our staff being properly trained? I don't know these things. If there's, and I'm, that's my question to the board. I understand we can't have an impenetrable fortress, but I want to make sure we have a school system where we're doing everything. And I want to know that my child is safe, that your children are safe, that our teachers are safe. And that's, I just want to make sure that, you know, in medicine, we do evidence based practice. We have to make recommendations based off of that. Schools have to do the same. So, that's my question to the board. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, we'll move on. The floor is closed. Next up, item five, administrative services. Uh, these are study committee minutes. Mr. Frizee is not here, so I will read them on his behalf. Uh, members present were Lynn Baker, uh, First of all, it happened on September 12, 2022. Members present were Lynn Baker uh, via Google Meet, and I was uh, physically present at the meeting along with Superintendent Cheryl. Um, the Thrun annual policy updates at the October 17, 2022 Board of Education meeting. Superintendent Cheryl will bring for action to the Board of Education policy changes to several Midland Public Schools policies as recommended by the Thrun Law Firm in the summer of 2022 updates. Policy revisions are provided to committee members with ample time for review, and they were reviewed by the committee members. Uh, committee members ask questions to get clarification during this meeting. Superintendent Shero and Administrative Service Committee members discuss the following board policies that have proposed changes, and all of those are listed um, on the agenda minutes, which will be posted for a month, Mike, is that right? Okay, so if anybody wants to look those individual policies up, they're certainly there to be reviewed. Uh, the policies to be presented for action at the October 17, 2022 board meeting will be included in the documentation for board members to review before the meeting. The next administrative services meeting will be done as needed. And that's all I have for reading. And in fact, that's the end of item five, administrative services. So moving on, number six, finance facilities and operations. Uh, we have study committee minutes from Mr. Lauterbach. Topics included various sections in the audit report, including financial statements, a single audit, and governance communication. The uh, audit proclaimed an unmodified opinion or clean audit, and an addition of $1.4 million to the general fund balance. Second item was an SEL update. Penny Miller Nelson and Amanda Sherry provided an update to the committee on the services available in the Midland Public Schools to support the well being of students and staff. We reviewed the July and August financials. Or, uh, which will be presented at the October Board of Education meeting. This is the uh, district's traditional practice due to year-end reporting and focus on the audit. Uh, Macespa, the district was approached by the grounds and trades union to enter uh, contract extension talks this fall. The committee was briefed on potential terms. We talked about device purchases. The administration will recommend the purchase of 100 additional Chromebooks at the September Board of Education meeting due to enrollment coming in higher than originally projected. The ESSER 3 amendments, feedback was sought from the committee on potential amendments to the current ESSER 3 spending plan. Modifications are needed due to several supplemental grants included in the 22-23 school aid budget. Feedback included from the committee chair, one-time uh, staff compensation packages from Trustee Blazy, meal price reduction and at-risk student-focused programming. Trustee Rausch suggested short-term parent-student fee relief, uh, which will uh, talk about further later. Uh, the school safety grant committee uh, was briefed on the district's 
consultation with Alliance Technologies and local law enforcement on the Evolve Weapons Detection System. The administration will propose the purchase of 10 systems to be installed throughout the secondary buildings at uh, tonight's board meeting. The next FFO meeting will be Monday, October 3rd at 5 p.m. Okay, so Scott, before you move on, you know, when John read the minutes, there are a number of items that Brad, John, and I discussed at FFO, especially in light of what we've seen, right? We've got 33% fund balance. We've added to the fund balance seven years in a row. We also need, you know, there is an argument to be made are we spending enough and are we spending it in the right spot? So I, I think it's probably appropriate for the board to, to have this discussion of the things that we discussed in the FFO meeting around, you know, is there a possibility to give relief to the parents? Um, you know, as inflation increases and it, it, we have sports fees or, or other items, Brad mentioned uh, you know, the free, free lunch was a, a big help to many parents uh, over the last year and a half. And John talked about, you know, staff and, and making sure that we compensate them correctly. And I guess it's probably a, a reasonable time to maybe open the floor to Brad and John and say, should we be talking about those things now? Um, and, you know, especially building off of what Lori and, and her team have just presented to us, we're in a we're in a position where we can spend some more money. Um, All right, well, let's visit about that for a minute. John, what's what time around? Yeah, well, I, I, you know, even before COVID, um, our district, uh, because of, um, I think, fairly conservative financial management practices, has traditionally run at a, at a fund balance or savings account, for lack of a better term, uh, that is well in excess of what our auditors recommend. Um, as Phil said, we're at 33%. There's actually about 6% that's assigned to specific things that we know are coming down the road. So we've been prudent and we've, we've assigned certain uh, portions of that $30 million for uh, capital improvements and things that we know are uh, copier replacement and so forth. But, you know, we're still running at 27%, which is about 7% higher than the recommended range. You know, it's a percentage of our operating budget that they recommend we keep in. Uh, in savings, and it's taken a you know a, a team to get there, uh, and I think like like any business or any other uh, uh, enterprise, it's appropriate to recognize the team that helped you get there. Um, and so what I what I hope uh, Brian and the and and Mike will do. Uh, Brian's not here tonight. It's probably not you know we would I'd like to have his input uh, from a financial standpoint, but I'd like to look at what the financial impact would be on one-time bonuses. Not to change our, our, our steps or our collective bargaining agreement, but just to recognize uh, the team that got us here and help, helps us sit on a 33% fund balance with, with, a, with a bonus plan. So, is that something we should look at, Mike? So, Brian, you know, the chief of the, the here's the, the chief of the relations bureau, right? So, I'm still under the law. Um, Pim and I ran some numbers for the discussion. interest in and so yeah we've ran those numbers on the employee side since we're a collective bargaining group um, we would approach our collective bargaining groups we have a meeting Wednesday with the teachers and we have a follow-up and we will come back to you on that discussion on the one-time compensation um, bonus for the teachers um, and support staff with their thought group the uh, two fees you guys mentioned um, we ran those as well Normally call Penny and Jeff if we did both breakfast and lunch. But I think we have numbers for both of those to give to you if we did go back to what the federal government was covering and that we covered. And remember, some of it's fund balance, but some of it's also the additional funds that are coming through the ESSER. So right. there were some addition categories that we received that put um, Brian and Penny, who's also part of the that responsibility of those grants and Lori's group, into looking at, at some of these things as well. And then um, you guys mentioned uh, sports, fees. sports, and, and um, I caution you to be careful how you say all those things, and make sure we set it clearly that it's a one-time. We, we probably can't sustain those forever, and so one-time bonus has a, a year of a semester, a year we can visit our free and reduced, and 
um, athletic piece set aside in some capacity going forward. For would, would that be would just focusing on the, the food for a minute? Uh, did you envision that, Brad, for, well, why don't you tell us what you were thinking there? Was it for every student for, for free lunch for a year or something? What were I didn't have an exact plan because okay. I don't know what would be sustainable and for how long. Gotcha. If it would be a semester, if it would be a year, if it would be focusing more on elementary. I don't really have a, a plan for that, but it, I guess we'd have to run through some what ifs to see what's the one off. I don't want to speak for you, Brad, but I think he came here because he was talking about the food service fund that got so large because right. of all the free meals that we were able to get out of the food service. We could in that one. That's a good idea. Order. I think we had two different discussions. One was, do we go, you know, extend free and reduce lunch, or the other discussion that I believe we had was, do we, do we buy down the increase, right? right? Because we, as a district, we have to go through this kind of complicated calculation as to what do we have to set food. Well, that's what we at, already did for right? you. And so, um, um, gosh, we do need Brian sometimes in this area, <laughs> going the room uh, on this one. But um, so I think we were set to get a 25 to 50 cent increase. So there, our lunches are set. We have to hit a minimum of what they reimburse for the free lunch. Okay. So my knowledge is somewhat there. That penny is it. But um, it, that would have driven the lunches up 25 to 50 cents. And we chose to do a dime or something increase on that and hope the parents they probably know it better than I do because they're paying it but we, we we paid that down to keep it down for the year we've already done put that one in place we used some yeah. of those funds there so uh, Brad was still was looking at what Jessica mentioned is we can't spend that food because and many people understand grants and categories are very restrictive on where you spend them which we'll talk about the safety grant in a little while as well food service has to be spent only in food service so many of the items that we had procured through the years of free lunch were um, updating the cafeteria and the kitchen equipment. And so hence what Jessica mentioned was that some of that was delayed in purchasing. So hence we got a little reprieve that we weren't bad. We just need to spend. That's where I think Brad, not speaking for you, but the conversation was, hey, should we spend some of that relief more parents? So we could bring that number back to FFO and eventually to the full board as well, along with the employees, along with what your cost would be Bill, if you set aside um, athletic fees. And that would be just to put a ribbon on it. Um, would be a one-time. That's my one, suggestion. One time the guy who doesn't like to spend like money over here and he makes me really nervous to spend money. As you guys know, um, I would suggest you always to limit not sustainability and wonder where you're going to go on your priorities. And that would take effect obviously next year because we are already. Well, you could do that now. You could say second semester. You could do those now. And the athletic fees are they're easier. We either do a reimbursement, which I don't think is the right way to do it. I think Jeff and I have talked about a little bit behind the scenes when that came up. We would say, like, winter to winter. So you still get a year. Those people who pay in the fall potentially could get the relief oh. the following year because it, yeah. the reimbursement's a nightmare to do. Okay. All right. So some good ideas to explore. Yeah, Thanks, we'll guys. bring all that back through finance then to, to the full board. Okay. Thanks. Any other comments? About oh, 6.1. Okay, we'll move on. Next up is our another action item. We have device purchases. Mike? Yeah, um, as mentioned in the minutes, uh, enrollment is up. We have 8,000 student devices out there that go through quite a bit of damage and wear and tear, as you can imagine, with students using them. And so we're looking for 100 replacements, so we do not have any pause in service when that occurs. And so the uh, 100 computers um, that I would go to see at say high computer products out of Rochester Hills in the amount of thirty thousand eight hundred fifty one dollars, um, and we would use the Esther funds for that as well because those are the funds that were designed to cover during that COVID extension period. We're looking for you to approve that tonight. Okay. Make a motion to approve item six point two for the purchase of one hundred Chromebooks for a total of thirty thousand eight hundred fifty one dollars. Support. Motion by Mr. Roche, support by Mr. Hatfield. Any additional discussion regarding item 6.2? It's a good problem to have when your enrollment's up so much you gotta buy more devices. Yeah, well, it's, it's, they're, really, they're really good to have. Two of my children right out of the gate had problems with their brand new Chromebooks and immediately they were given replacements. They didn't have to wait for them. Mm -hmm. There was no, it was seamless. So having these extra ones um, I think are, are critical. Uh, any additional discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? 
None? Okay, well, it's curious. Thank you. Next up, uh, Mike, item 6.3. This is the evolved security devices. Yeah, I'm going to probably go off track just a little bit on this one. So when the school aid fund came out and they approved the budget in June, uh, there was lots of categoricals in there. And so you heard about grants, and there's a lot of when categories are grants and, and they're in categories and that comes with a lot of ties and we have to figure out how to spend those and we had heard these safety grant was coming and I sat in front of the uh, Senate committee and and uh, they got questioned about how can we harden schools and increase safety. And one of the discussions came about with metal detectors and <clears throat> I just happened to have been in this career long enough that I've experienced metal detectors in schools and you could not get our kids in a timely manner into school, nor the environment or the field of the metal detector would be appropriate for schools. And I've seen weapons still get through, so nothing's bulletproof on that. And so um, off that discussion, and when I saw they had passed the amount, we began to play about what our money would be, because at the time it wasn't clear uh, how much money that would be. Today, it appears that um, it's based on a blind account. Our enrollment account doesn't happen until October but it's at least 800,000 and likely to be about $900,000 that have to be spent on school safety, hardening your target in your school. So when you talk about um, what we've done in the past with video surveillance, single salad port entries at the doors, um, lots of hidden features behind the scene that people don't realize that we don't share because it's protected by law on how we would respond to an event as well as the EOP, the Raptor Alert System, communication tools, teachers being trained on Alice. Um, there isn't many protocols left out there that we haven't done. So I happen to see this technology be advertised and it is a weapon surveillance system that you do not need to take anything technically out of your pockets or anything. You walk through these gates and not even knowing you have them. I'll give you some examples. And so we begin to look at it and we contact a company who talked to several school districts who use them and I'll give you one of the examples where you probably have walked through one this summer I went to a concert at the Soaring Eagle and I was walking out and my wife said Jesus we're not being checked at all at the gate and I looked over and I said that's because we're going through a weapons detection system right now honey and it was the same company so I asked one of the regular guards there about it and he said hey I don't know much about it but there's our head of security and I had an opportunity to talk to him as well and um, they glowed about it and so we we been at this for a couple months looking and researching these. Um, it's very new technology, nothing's perfect. It's grown already since its inception. So the idea is to get students in to the building quickly, but still securely. And are they bulletproof? Or are they gonna have uh, problems uh, uh, catching things that they shouldn't? Yes. So they have sensitivity levels and you can set them to be as hard as you would like. But the beauty of this one is students won't even know what's being triggered on them. So we have a screen, we see the item in a red box where it's detected it. And so if we can't determine a book bag where there's a lot of stuff in there, we may have to have the students step aside and do a courtesy check. Um, but typically, the items that they know of, and this happens at the Red Wings, Pistons game, casinos all across the country, large school districts, Charlotte, Mecklenburg, out South Carolina you know, 100,000 students, they're using these, device, these devices. And you have to train people quickly how to get through them, um, but they will trigger on a few things. Older Chromebooks have a hinge that they'll trigger on. So you, one of the things they've learned to do is have the Chromebook out of the book bag, so you don't have to stop them, because it'll red box on the Chromebook, you see it in his hand, you just keep, and they just keep right on with it. So our concept on this, um, as we begin to look at it, is to um, have a couple months where we train parents, students, staff about what to expect, have a st soft start before we try a few doors, and then when we're ready to fully implement and implement them at our secondary buildings. <clears throat> Most school shootings, as you know, that have occurred from within have been in the secondary building. So staff or student occurring from outside, that's been some of the elementary buildings. Should we put these in the elementary buildings? Well, I think we need to see how well they work and then progress going forward. I'm not sure we'll ever be able to scan elementary students as well as secondary. We'll be able to, secondary will pick up quickly and train themselves and know how to move through a door. Um, but I think we should probably explore doing adults at the elementary because that's typically been the instinct. So again, you add this layer of protection with everything we have, we're probably making ourselves the hard target that this 
bad guy does not let them do. Um, at some point, I'll come back with another one <clears throat> because this will help prevent most weapons from in school, right? But supposedly you could get some through a door, someone could bring some in, and then there's another device called NGYs. Did I say that right, Dave? I always say it wrong. Is that the right one? Angel eyes. That um, if it comes up, our camera system will pick it up, alert all of us of a weapon as well. So we'll continue to evolve on all these pieces. But the question we had tonight from parent is our staff is about as well trained as can be. Jeff and DeAndre are kind of our safety coordinators. We meet with the police regularly, monthly, if not long more. The police were involved in this process with us in selecting this product and looking at it. And so um, I can tell you, we fully bet it is a perfect no. Um, will it be, that's what we're gonna do South Start. Could it be a slow learn on it? Absolutely. But we won't do that and hold kids up from instructional time until we're ready to go on that. So the money's there, this is what it's designed for. It can only spend on school safety. It won't cover quite all of it. The pieces that it won't cover, the 100, 150 that it may not, is because you have multiple years of licensing that we would have to purchase out of that through ours to keep it up to date and keep it um, moving through the software components of that. What's the uh, ramp up period? How long do you anticipate it would take to train us to train these kids effectively to be safe uh, with this technology? So we had Jeff go out and meet the building principals. They've already been looking at how they would set up at every building. So when we brought this crew in, we went out and walked our buildings. It's how we selected them, how many do we think we need, and how we operate. Then the building principals are designing the plan for it at the doors. Um, depending on when the technology gets here, they they want to start well in every school district too, and they've used what they've learned from other districts, and they're saying, we're going to be on site for a week or two, and we want to run a few people through it, train your... Tra Take turns with the school and helping each building staff just to come and sit and do, look out a system where it's like a tablet that swipe kids through. Uh, but each principal is going to send a proposal to us you know, later this month, how they would staff each of the doors at their site. So in my mind, John, and what I've heard from the company is we would have them all here set up, ready to go somewhere around Thanksgiving. We take Thanksgiving to Christmas for the soft start, start second semester. And do we have enough cash in each of the buildings? To manage That's part of the proposal. We're going to have that sort of do a self-assessment. Yeah. Yeah. So you got the SRO, you got a few assistant principals, but you are right. We think it could take more, particularly in the beginning. And so we're looking at support staff who would we want them to work an extra hour in the morning, extra hour in the afternoon to give us assistance on that in the beginning. They... The company claims this is lower uh, um, person involvement than weapons or uh, metal detectors because that's all people driven. This is not, but you do have somebody monitoring. You do might have to have the courtesy check on some backpacks, and so we want to make sure we have enough personnel prepared for that. And, and we might be able to downsize as we go. And our presentation to the three people for the day because they said it would be more efficient and probably would not. And you see on the proposal, single gates and double gates. So the large entrances will have doubles, single gates. These are portable, easy portable. So I, at some point I could see us doing football games and large basketball events because they certainly are also areas that we would protect people so, from. So technically, you know, I'm thinking about Dow High in particular, the one I'm most familiar with. Yep. Um, they go in the front door or, well, either of the front entrances and they can stand there. Yeah, so there's three doors that will have those that, um, if I remember right at Dow High when we walked it, so they come in three basic, basically entrances and they will have them at each door. The bigger, larger ones have the double. Okay. That helps you at all, and then maybe off just yeah. exactly on that. Okay. Mike, can you speak more to the student psyche when they walk through this? The, the whole concept to... is this, is that they, they almost don't know this. I mean, obviously they're going to learn, Right. hey, I got to hold the darn uh, yeah. Chromebook out. Some water bottles trigger it. They may have to get a smaller water bottle. We'll be able to determine on a smaller water bottle it's a water bottle and just let it go. But if it's large enough, could a weapon be in there? So I, it, so there could be some inconvenience, but the idea, like my wife and I go in the sore angle. If you've been out there, you leave the casino and you go out to the outside. She didn't know we were going through anything, and I wouldn't have if I hadn't already looked at those. We didn't take anything out of our pockets, you know, like you had to uh, in prior right at the airport. So the idea is it feels still more like a school. Yes, our kids are smart enough to know there's something there, and they which isn't all bad, because mm -hmm. it also makes that kid who's thinking about, when we say weapons detections, this is pocket knives, 
all kinds of weapons, and they'll tell you that's the first thing they get. They get tons of knives in the beginning. We, we probably don't know what's coming in our buildings every day on that. Well, don't you want to know? I don't. I don't know when when Disney implemented this technology, but it used to be when you went into Disney World, you had to empty your, take all the metal out of your pocket, put it in a in a bowl, go through a metal detector, and if it didn't go off, you got your stuff back. But there's this line through this single person. Now you go to Disney and they tell you just keep walking, and and I, they they have wide you know much wider than, than we're contemplating. But you never stop. You just you keep walking. You really don't know you're being screened except if you look carefully at the police officer, he's looking at an iPad that is telling him, okay, John's got something, John's got that water bottle in his pocket, stop him. And, and, Courtesy but, check, don't make it heavy. Right. So we'll yeah, have somebody I mean, it, but, basically but standing keeps, like in front, yeah. keeps track with the you. monitoring device to be over to the side. Yeah. So the monitor would trigger Jeff who's standing out front and say, hey, can, you, can you come on over there for a minute? We can take a little look. And those few devices that they're doing, the kids learn real quick. Hey, I'm not going to bring this one. I'm just going to hold it out so you know. Mm -hmm. And we'll train that. We're going to try to get a visual aids and a video and all those pieces so parents and kids know what's expected before they come in. And this is trackable data. This is uh, metrics are established from studying this that you can raise and lower your bar of sensitivity based on the metrics of what you're finding. It's compiling all of this data over and over and over again of, of everything that's being found. Including new weapons. So they get yep. they got an agreement with almost all weapon manufacturers who don't want to not be able to sell their stuff. And as soon as they release a new weapon, they can send them the new specs that will deny in the AI. And you good point on sensitivity level, Brad. You know, they run them at a reasonably high level. But if you were to have a threat or incident, You'd probably be okay that next couple of days running at the highest level, which would be a little slower run into the building. Yeah, and there's three pieces of technology. You've got the camera, you've got the security cameras, you have the detectors themselves, and then you have the AI technology that's running in the background. Um, so they are upgradable as we move forward over time. And then um, depending on how we have those dialed in, it's... 4,000 kids per hour can run through one station, one door. So they're moving. Yeah, if it goes well, like you know, most places they have, you don't ever stop walking. You may not be sprinting, but you don't ever stop walking is the concept. And, and maybe an important, or maybe it's an opportune time to address the, the parent that talked to us tonight about what are the other factors of safety that we have going? And when I think about this, I think about it like a layer of Swiss, Swiss cheese yeah. for every single piece of safety implementation that we have, whether it's the boots on the doors, the single point of entry. Um, and each of these, you hope that the, the holes in the Swiss cheese never line up. And that's not to say that we're not also focused on the mental health of our students and making sure that our staff is prepared. It's the, it's the number one thing. So, right. Um, I've been a school minister since 1997, prior to Kyle Line, and went through all of that. So since that day, we've concentrated on hardened targets, but it's really all been about. And I got condemned for using some of these words, so hopefully I say them right. Four or five years ago, it, much of it's mental wellness and mental health component of it, and so we have put huge amount of dollars on that that probably many parents don't know, but we try to advertise as much as we can. Hey, how many SEL specialists do we have now? So their component is to work on wellness and identify, if there's identification of someone not struggling, and we have worked with staffing, PD, to help identify. We don't want staff to be the social worker, but we want to be able to help identify people who's are healthy as well. So mental health is a huge component from both staff and students on keeping schools safe. It's the most proactive approach to it, correct? But this is a pretty proactive approach too, right? <clears throat> proactive, not just the responses to an event. There's there's a response to an event, there's proactive approaches to it. And we, we, we have heavy, heavy practice and tools on all of that, including response. Our response would be very good in this district.
to move. Support. Motion by Mr. Lutterbach, support by Mr. Rauch. Any additional discussion? I can move all the security devices. What was timing again? Yeah, so he one time told me six weeks, another saying four weeks, Greg. So I think four weeks will issue the PO tomorrow if you guys approve. And when do we get the form? As um, soon as we have the ability, we, we, we have to fill form out saying we're accepting the funds. They, they come to us, and then later the compliance comes to show how you how okay. you fill that out. They'll be here. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? None. Motion carried. Thank you very much. And thank, right. thank you, legislators, on it. They did a great job on that. Yeah. And they made it not as cumbersome as many other grants. Okay, uh, you're up again, Mike, at 6.4 information only. Yes. Yes, so just only information. So traditionally, Brian doesn't cover each one of them, but we'd like to thank all the donators and, and donating what appears to be uh, in this acceptance of about $10,000. Um, the gifts range from girls' swim team, private choir lessons. My Star Mini Grant, Teacher Wish List, Video Technology, and all of these get scrolled at the end of the meeting for acknowledgement of their wonderful gifts. So thank you to our wonderful community supporting us. All right, thank you. That'll bring us to item seven, human resources, 7.1. Uh, just want to note, it does not appear that there are any committee minutes to read, so we'll we go didn't. Right, we didn't. So we'll Sorry. go right to Mr. Jackson. Thank you. Uh, and I only have one name to share tonight, so, um, and this is a uh, Retirement notice. So Chris Saber, the teacher at Jefferson Middle School, um, retired last at the end of May, May 31st, and he, he is no longer with us. But he had served a long career with us in many different positions. Okay, thanks. Uh, next up, item 8.1, our letters from the Board of Education to the entities listed. 8.2 is a letter to the Board of Education from Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. Uh, item 9.1. List the remaining uh, scheduled meetings for 2022. Uh, following that is a list of meetings that I believe are proposed uh, for 2023. Uh, finally, closing the night, item 10. Um, are there any points of clarification or further discussion before I turn the floor over to Mike? Just uh, Mike's comment about thanking your legislators resonated with me because I, I know a lot of us had discussions with. Senator Stamas and Representative Glenn about 31A funding, um, unfunded pension liabilities, and security, all three of which we discussed tonight. So obviously want to make sure that our board acknowledges their help in getting those funds, which we reviewed tonight. Amen. Yeah, um, so we mentioned energy and the energy bond and the audit Jessica did. and. Um, both the bond and the energy bond have done significant things. We'll bring, or bring you more information as we go. But um, the when I got here, I think one of our buildings had energy star rated, and all the rest weren't even close. And um, all of them will now be under star rated. I gave you how much. In fact, that um, we use a little bit less energy than we used prior to the bond when there was hardly any air conditioning. So we we pay for all our conditions with our savings that we've added. So it tells you how efficient we've become on energy. Anytime you save dollars in energy, which is usually your third largest uh, purchase item in the in the district, you're putting money back into a classroom instruction where it needs to be instead of wasting it on energy. Um, so we talked about Megan, who her and her husband have decided to go to Traverse City, um, get there before me. I'm, I don't know if I how she did that but um we're, we're sorry to lose megan as as she's picked up the role from cindy very very well and so i reached out to sarah Dooley, who came highly recommended uh, seabird if you don't know sarah and sarah has graciously accepted a new challenge and megan megan promises we won't scare off we'll get her on a good footing going on and she's going to tell her how easy i am to work alongside as well so <laughs> so manager of communication who also handles the board going uh, matters going forward a uh, series three bonds. We met today with our financial consultant, and um, so too early he'll come back with a plan. But I think we heard all kinds of good news, despite interest rates being high, that um, our our financial rating is a plus 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 out of the market, and um, we will probably save money on the sale because we should be able to do an easy negotiated sale versus the market sale, and then um, the refunding and the opportunity to go back out for funds. 
uh, we, that we've talked about left the out was way earlier than I originally thought. And I won't give you a date yet, but he's putting some numbers together to bring back to you guys. Paul Snarder is our consultant, and they used to be Starter and Barge, and Lloyd's left me, and they are now PFM, PFM, so um, services. And so Paul is the guru in the state. We happen to be lucky to have him, so we're, uh, we're very fortunate on that. And enrollment, as we mentioned, is up. Um, kindergarten enrollment, our largest kindergarten enrollment that I can see in maybe 12 or more years. Um, and so when you look at the total number of kindergartners in our county, we um, are number one, we're getting 72% of them, we're getting 82% of those. So we'll keep doing that. That's all I have, Scott. Uh, one quick question. Do you have a, like a year-to-date dollar amount that we've saved? And, and energy savings? So we're putting all that together for you. Okay. And so um, between Mike on the Energy Star uh, information comes, Bart Mallow and the architect, they're reviewing all, all of us and they're going to, they're planning for a presentation to you on a, like a summation of series one and two, what it's accomplished for you. Mixed in there will be the energy bond. Obviously, I think they're pretty blurred, you know, what we did between the two of them. That's a no brainer, by the way. That's even looking better than it ever, than we did. We just hit the market right and remember, and you guys are involved in that. Um, but we're going to bring you a summation, and then they're, they're walking the buildings again, looking at the future of what we might need going forward. We'll probably will bring all that to FFO and at some point to the full board to review uh, how where, where the building district looks at this point. Because we still have to remember we've done a lot of work, and we've put a lot of not only bond dollars, energy bond dollars, general fund capital improvements in. We still have very old buildings. So we have to keep that in mind. Support. Support. Motion by the check. We'll support by Mr. Rush. All in favor? Say aye. 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 We stand adjourned. Thank you, everybody.